Hello, my name is Steve Peterson. I'm the director of bands at Ithaca College, and I'm with my colleagues Mark Fonder and Beth Peterson, also conductors and music education faculty here at Ithaca College, and our special guest Frank Battisti. And we're going to have a discussion today for banddirector.com about a variety of topics uh, that might be of some use to uh, anybody who's listening. So, our first question. Well, I guess I'm going to start the ball rolling here and just ask, uh, what are some of the considerations that we have when we're selecting music as a school band director? I think um, that uh, an important consideration is to get a piece that is interesting, imaginative, and has some kind of development of some kind of material. It doesn't have to be complex, but is it some kind of thematic development, uh, rhythmic development, something where uh, it's not just regurgitating a theme uh, in a different key, but that, that one can see how a creative mind has taken material and used it to create something. Um, I think that to look through all the parts and make sure the parts are interesting. I mean, if you're going to do three pieces with your group, make sure within the three pieces that everybody has interesting parts, because uh, tuba players like to play melodies too. Um, the instrumentation, uh, the kind that fits your ensemble, um, and I, I think that if you, if you, for example, do not have, uh, I remember once uh, doing the Mozart Serenade Number no. Ten, a movement of it, it uh, when I was a high school band director, and I only had three French horn players. Uh, I told my euphonium player to uh, play the fourth horn part and sound like a French horn, and uh, he did. And so, um, I think if you can make. Uh, a reasonable substitution without uh, destroying the integrity of the piece that you should do it because in doing that piece my oboe players and bassoon players had a wonderful wonderful opportunity um, I, 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 it, I think you should avoid selecting music where you have to do extensive drilling because um, the ensemble should be a collaborative music making experience. That's very different than drilling parts. Mm -hmm. So that um, uh, pick pieces that challenges the technical facility of the players, but only to the degree that they can be successful. So you're always challenging, challenging them just enough to keep them moving, but not enough to bust them or break them. Um, and that way you, you will select music where you can get beyond the notes and, and try to get into the notes where the musical expression and meaning is. So, and that's important because if kids never experience the power of music, the, the meaningful message, power of music, they don't know what, they think that playing uh, music is playing the right notes. And that's uh, completely uh, devoid of any kind of musical significance. And they select music with a variety of styles, so that they, because by doing that you can teach history, you can teach kids about the evolution of the art. Um, pick things that have varying kinds of texture, so that they're not all 2D, so that there's opportunities for students to play solos once in a while, duets within the large ensemble, um, and, and make sure that the music is appropriate for the occasion or for the environment. Because uh, if I am asked to play something at the seventh inning stretch, uh, inning, uh, at the Boston Red Sox, New York Yankees baseball games, and I can play Trower Symphony or Take Me Out to the Ball Game, I'm going to play Take Me Out to the Ball Game because if I play Trower <laughs> Symphony, uh, first of all, I'm not doing Wagner any good because nobody's going to listen to it. Uh, so that the music has to be appropriate to the environment, to the um, moment, the situation, uh, and appropriate for the, this, the level of the, of the child. Let me interject just one thing too, or, or expand on it. I think it's really important to, to program music that the students can attain really easily, especially you know, the, 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 the technical part, that they don't have to worry about technique, at least on one or two pieces on a program, so they can simply learn how to feel and express without having to, to deal with technique. Of course, we want to pick music where the technique's going to improve. Um, finding that level is, is part of the challenge, but certainly picking pieces where 
they can simply feel what the music is doing for them and, and what they can do for others is, is really important. Frank, I'm curious as to what your philosophy would be um, in terms of choosing a transcription. Is that something that you feel strongly? Absolutely. Um, a, a child, if you're studying music, which is what we're charged to teach, and a child does not know what it's like to experience a Bach chorale or feel what it's like to be in the middle of Wagner's chromatic harmony, then you have denied that kid an incredible uh, musical ex discovery. So that, yeah, and, and you'd, pick out, you'd pick out, a, the issue is picking out a good transcription, but transcriptions are totally legitimate as far as I'm concerned and have to be used if you're going to teach music as an art in the band because uh, we did, Bach didn't write anything for us. And, and Wagner wrote one piece, but uh, uh, Charles Symphony is not Elsa's procession to Cathedral. Can we talk a little bit about um, amount of performances per year? Should should bands be performing more or or performing less and working more on, on, on the same piece of music and getting it really good for one or two performances or playing lots of concerts and lots of different pieces? I don't think they have to be exclusive of each other at all. I've, I have learned over the years that more performances tend to make players better because they have to prepare more quickly and more efficiently. It makes me better, it makes them better too. I think that can be overdone too, but in, in my opinion, most public school teachers do not program enough concerts. Certainly I think that one concert a semester is insufficient and is not doing any, any uh, favors to the students who, who are only experiencing then perhaps two concerts worth of music in an entire year. Um, on the other hand, there is something to be learned from taking a difficult piece and, and perfecting it. There, there, is, there, there are non-musical things to learn from achieving perfection, but I think that gets in the way sometimes. Um, students will expand the, the amount of time they have or the amount of work they have into the time they have. If they have six weeks to get a concert ready, they're going to take six. If they have 12 weeks, they're going to take 12. Um, and I think it's really important to, to push them a little bit, myself. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm one who feels that um, progress is made by diminishing the time that one achieves excellence, which means that we all have to get better, so that by uh, stressing the development of the individual, the responsibility of the individual to prepare for the rehearsal, uh, the length of time needed becomes less and less which means you can do more and more. Rather than the number, it's a matter of being able to create space so you can do more things. And it seems to me that that's it. Once, I mean, ideally, I mean, I, I'm a firm believer that a rehearsal schedule should be posted at least a week in advance. It should be very specific. We're playing this piece from uh, rehearsal number 13 until rehearsal number 60, and that uh, there is reason, uh, there one should expect that one can help students develop an understanding that it's their responsibility to be prepared so when they come to the, the uh, rehearsal, they're not going to be drilling and learning their parts. Right. They're going to be in a collaborative music-making situation. We're putting it together. I mean, it's a, all the things plug into the same thing, but it's a matter always of trying to make the kid be more responsible, more... Uh, uh, dedicated, uh, accountable. Yeah, yeah, and that's right, and and, and that takes time. I mean, I, I guess I'd say uh, one of the things I'd say to every band director would be to choose the place you want to teach and plan to stay there fifteen years because you can't make these things happen mm -hmm. quickly. And we're in a very mobile society. Everybody wants the best gig, and so we're it's, it. People move. You can't build these kind of things in a short period of time. You have to make a commitment to the community. The community senses the fact this person is committed to this. We become committed to the person. Together you can do <clears throat> marvelous things. But it does take time. It does take time. And you shouldn't try to do it too fast. Because you create revolutions, you lose too much. It's an evolutionary process. You give me a person who is a real artist musician and 
and I have the most important ingredient because the technique part of it is relatively easy as far as I'm concerned. I don't find it difficult. What I find hugely difficult is the imaginative mind, a creative mind, a sensitive mind. That, that is rare because their, their education has never... I mean, I ask kids when I go to places and I ask them, tell me the courses where you thought your imagination was challenged in. Most of them say nothing, not even their lessons. They were told what to do and how to do it. Nobody said, come in tomorrow with a story. Imagination, cultivating imagination. We're in the arts and we don't cultivate imagination. How does a young, maybe newer teacher who's out already teaching and dealing with a lot of stuff in the, in the teaching world, administrative stuff, go back to that or get to that place where he or she can become imaginative and creative mm -hmm. and study music Great. and become more musical? I tell you how it happened to me. When I was, in, I was a young teacher and I began to hear my kids talking about Shakespeare and Dickens mm -hmm. and all these incredible authors that I had never read. I was stupid. Mm -hmm. They made me aware of what I didn't know. I couldn't talk their language. So I decided I had to start reading poetry, I had to start reading literature, because Man, I, I, I just don't know anything. I'm a mechanical person. They've taught me how to make a band sound good. I know how to do it. But teaching music or teaching art or teaching creativity, whew, that's another story. So that the, the curriculum is so jam full of vocational type things, developing skills, that there's no chance to develop the humanity, the creative human being, the imaginative one, um, the one that solves problems in different ways. That's that's what we don't cultivate. And I I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm serious about this. I, I I would hear these kids talking about this literature, and I said to myself, I've never read that before. So I I, I think that. Um, how does a director turn that around? I mean, th there can be um, a background that the director brings into a situation that might be deeper um, or more profound than the students that he or she is teaching. Yeah, I mean, so, if, if, if the person has sung a Mozart Requiem and played a Brahms symphony, and then they're going to bring they're going to bring a lot. But if in many many places that grant music education degrees, they never do that. So. You are what you consume. So what? In other words, what I'm saying is that the, the development of an artist should be essential in the development of a music educator. That without that, you're, you're dealing with someone who can dispense technical information and create machines. But you don't know what art is until you... So, so let's talk specifically about the, the teacher who's out there. They're in the middle of Iowa, or Kansas, or <laughs> New York, mm -hmm. or Idaho, or anywhere. And they're 100 miles from culture as we know it. And they're listening to this video, and they're saying, that's me, and I know that I need to, I need to grow. Okay. I need to grow as a, as a musician, as an artist, as a learned thinker. What are some specific things? All where you where would you do, send these all people? All you got to do is turn on your computer. I did, I couldn't turn on my computer. All right. I had to get in the car and go places. I had to go to a library. I had to go to a concert. Now all I do is punch it, and it's right there. It's. I mean, there's no uh, lack of opportunities. But isn't that also part of the problem? There's too many opportunities? Absolutely. Well, there's too many opportunities in the sense that... Um, um, I mean, how can there, we focus? There's, 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 the smorgasbord of opportunities is enticing. And so there has to be a priority of what you're going to 
hit on the computer. So if I'm interested in developing my uh, knowledge of great masterpieces of music, then that's what I'm going to do on the, on the... If I have no priorities, I'm all over the place. But it's a matter of deciding... Priorities are, are important. I think music education right now is more interested in scope and embracing everything rather than going through the hard, hard job of prioritizing what six things we can teach that has ramifications that the child can continue to develop their knowledge and their appreciation of their skills. I mean, think about a literature teacher, English literature teacher. You know how many great novels written in the English language? I've got to pick out six that we're going to read. You have to establish some priorities. And that's what you have to do in all aspects of, of education, I think. There's never, the, in, in trying to make it broader, you're making it less deep. And it's superficial. So, uh, if I'm interpreting what you're saying correctly, you would look at a year's curriculum, a year's band curriculum, and say, look, I want to have pillars of great music supporting this curriculum. Is that how you would start yeah. with those pillars I, I and mean, then fill at, in the rest? With I mean, do we send our kids home every summer with listening lists and reading lists? No, we don't. Most every other discipline does. Mm -hmm. They do in English. We send them home, tell them to go and have a good time, go to camp, or, you know, learn how to, you know, handle kids and everything else. Um, no, I, I think, I think, yes, you know, I think there should be, no kid should graduate unless they've heard these pieces, read these books, that's it. And they can do it on summer. You don't have to do everything during the school year. That's what, that's what summers are for, you know. I mean, when I went to the college here, the, the Nothing we nothing was done for marching bands, nothing, and they told us, you know, if if you think you need it, then go someplace in the summertime, take a two week course, and that's it. But we, our priorities do, we we have our priorities doesn't allow for that, so we're not touching it. I I think that's what I think that's what education is about. It's about setting priorities all the time, and that's hard because you have got to really evaluate. But I'm going back to our original question. That has to do with the individual teacher setting priorities, too. Are they going to sit down and watch Downton Abbey, or are they going to go online and listen to the latest Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra uh, telecast, or are they going to find a combination of things? But we make our own priorities, too, about what we do in our off time. Not to say that we should be studying 24 hours a day. We all find our leisure in different ways, but we, we definitely make priority choices in, in that's one way that we all have to think about. Well, how's, is this going to make me grow, or am I going to sit and just stay well, here? The, the other thing too is, our the mentors that we've had are huge. If we were lucky enough, I mean, who were my mentors? Very few were band directors. We were, they were Warren Benson, and they were Corel Husa, and they were. And, and Warren always kept telling me, why do you play that funny music? Mm -hmm. I mean, if he hadn't, that's how it all started. When, when ben, Benson came back after a concert and says, Frank, you're doing a terrific job, but why do you play that funny music? Mm -hmm. I, that comment, that one comment changed my life. Mm -hmm. And it was because of having people around me like that who always questioned me, not about what my... You know what the mechanics were, but you know what I was using. I mean, it's supposed to be music. You know, I mean, I don't know if I would have done that without th those those questions. I don't. I'm sure I wouldn't have. So, but that was the raw material back then in terms of band literature was that kind of music. I mean, a, a lot of people played Paul Yoder and that's right, and, and, exactly. Uh, that's Walter, exa what, what was his name? Uh, uh, Harold Walters. Harold Walters. Yes, yeah. right. Yeah, right. That was the literature. But we're past that now. That's right. We, ha we have a body of literature really from beginners all the way up to grade six that but is when I, pretty strong stuff. Yeah, but when I, when I listen to, uh, when I adjudicate a couple times a year, I could ask those, many of those kids, many of those band directors, why do you play that funny music? Mm -hmm. Because they're playing funny music. They're not choosing 
the great literature. Because in order to play the great literature, you have to have a complete instrumentation. The bands don't, a lot of bands do not have complete instrumentation. You can't play the great literature without complete instrumentation. So they play the literature where the doubling is safe. And we know what kind of, we know what that, those are. Well, let's turn this around a second. Um, because if it's expressive music, um, you chose the Mozart, but had three horns. Mm -hmm. And then you put a, a, a euphonium player right. in that place. So uh -huh. you were able to, uh, or the students were able to experience that, uh -huh. that Mozart, yeah. great music. So um, can you see the parallels with um, choosing a great piece of music but you don't have necessarily the full instrumentation, but it happens to be cross-cued a lot. Is that, is that all right? It depends upon the cross-cueing. I mean, I would evaluate it like I evaluated a uh, original piece. Same way, if I felt it was all the things I talked about, then I, I, would, I would play it. So but unfortunately, have... so much of what is being played, not only is it instrumentation-wise, uh, safe, but it is very unimaginative. Very, there's very little development. Uh, I, I would, I, that's why I wouldn't use it. What can I, what can I, ex what ex if, if I'm eating junk food, I develop junk food body. Mm -hmm. If I'm e eating nutrition, I develop another kind of body. I'm trying to feed those kids nutritionists, nutrition, music with nutrition, so they're going to develop strong musical values. It, it shouldn't surprise anybody that they don't have strong musical values because of what they're eating. It sounds, if, if I'm interpreting what you're saying, because I think one of the things I struggle with as a teacher of teachers is how do I teach my students taste, to have good taste in music? But if they're reading Shakespeare and, and reading poetry and listening to good music and performing good music and becoming artful themselves, they no will problem. have great taste. No problem. No problem. That's it. That's exactly right. In other words, my, my, the bar of excellence rises in proportion to what I consume. And so if, if, if I'm consuming great art, then I, then I expect something than if I'm not. Because I don't think that a lot of band directors that, uh, that are not, in my estimation, using the, the best quality music, I don't think that they are stupid. I think they're ignorant. Nobody has helped them develop the standard that they should have. Yeah, otherwise they wouldn't be able to stomach it. <laughs> That's right. Exactly right. That's exactly right. I mean, I, my, all of our, we can all sit here and think about pieces we used to idolize that we don't idolize anymore. That's right. We have grown. That's right. And that's what, that's what, that's how it's done. And when you graduate, Depending upon where you go to school as an undergraduate and the kind of musical experiences you've had, the kind of literature that you've performed, you come out at a certain level of, ex of expectations of what excellence is. As you go on in life, depending upon what you consume, that level will either stay the same, sink, or rise. That's it. So, so let's talk about the sophistication, the, the sophistication level of um, students who might be in middle school. Um, you had mentioned there are some compositions or composers that um, we don't deal with anymore because we've grown more sophisticated and they don't speak to us. But when we were junior, in junior high, they spoke to us. And so do we revisit those, those steps with those younger students so that they can have this sequential step of growth as well? Or do we just start them where we are? at this point of sophistication. Do you understand that yes, there, there's, I, a, there's a level that... I, I understand completely what you're saying. Yeah. When, I, when I start a job, I start where, the, where they are. I grab the kid by the hand and gently put in one piece that's different. Same the other ones. Over a period of time, two, three. It's a gradual process where you elevate the kid by not taking away anything, but by adding to it, it's bigger. The world is bigger 
So that's what education, education is all about opening the person's world so they understand more and appreciate, not taking anything away from them. I'm not, I'm not substituting this for that, I'm just adding. So that, um, yeah, I mean, I, that's, I, I, you have to start where the, wherever the kids are. Yeah, let's, let's say you go into a program as a young teacher and all the students played the year before was Pirates of the Caribbean and selections from The Wiz and whatever. Uh, what, what I hear you saying is you can't simply pull no. the rug out from under no. them. Uh, you still have some of that stuff, and in the meantime, you start to gradually... Uh, See, my, 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 the other thing I should have mentioned about selecting music, you should select music in which they are comfortable and music where they're uncomfortable, just like you should study scores that way. Mm -hmm. If you want to grow, it has to be both. Because you're trying to help them explore places they've never been. And so you're the guide. And you have to be able to inspire them. You've got to be able to do all the things that we'd say teachers should do. In mo uh, motivate, inspire. Because you have to nudge them into their discovering. Yeah, I think I like that. You can't say it's good. You have to, you have to nudge them to the point where they have that eureka moment where they all of a sudden say, I like it. So, um, but, but I mean, so, so it's a gradual process, and, and I think you'll be frustrated. I mean, I think the first two or three years I taught, I wanted to resign every other day. <laughs> I was so frustrated. But that's part of what it is, because it's, it, it can't go fast. You have to be, you have to be, you know, trying to go like crazy at the same time realizing that there's patience involved in it. But there's always growth. You're always going mm -hmm. somewheres. There's no stagnation. I mean, and that's, you know, once the person leaves school, then they've got to continue to grow. They've got to continue to grow, whether it's formal education or informal education. They have to continue to grow until they die. Because a teacher who is excited about discovering things for their own fulfillment will never burn out. If you're not doing that, you're going to burn out because you get no fulfillment from it. I want to change the question just a little bit and ask all of you, um, and maybe maybe Frank can talk first, but you came from a school where maestro and band director were kind of the same thing, and band directors told people what to do and how it was supposed to be played and what it should sound like, and, um, and they weren't always nice about it. Now it seems like we we need to encourage more. We need to ask questions more, and and that's probably a good thing. How do how do you reconcile that, or did you did you change in your career? And and I mean, I saw you rehearse the band yesterday, and you would ask questions. You'd also tell them things. I'm sure I changed. Um, I think you have to. Um, you have, to, you have to know exactly what you want, and then you have to use psychology to know where these kids are, what they need, what you can do to get them to do the things that they should do that they might not want to do. But they're, they're, here's where the teacher becomes, I mean, the personality, the temperament of the teacher is huge. Because we don't want to be, we want to make this, see I, as, as a conductor, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to put myself out of business. As a teacher conductor, I want to get rid of me. The more that I can get that those kids to handle everything, the music comes from within them. And when it comes from them, it's better than when it comes from me. So I'm trying to get them to feel the pulse. I'm trying to get them to listen. I'm trying to get them to make decisions about phrasing. I'm trying to get them to do it because I don't want to do it. Because if I do it, they can't. They don't have to do it. But how do you balance that with your interpretation? You know how you want that music to sound. Yes, and it will. It will be within the. It'll be within my interpretation. But I allow the kid to make a contribution. In other words, if, if a kid's playing a solo and it isn't exactly what I want, but I think that it's, it's fine, it fits, it works, it's better do, they're doing it the way they want to do it than the way I want to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's completely off the, off the tracks, mm -hmm. then that's different, mm -hmm. see. But um, 
I'm trying to I'm trying to get them to to um, I, I mean in a sense I'm trying to get them to be a big chamber music group where I can almost disappear. I can start them. I can start them. I can be their ears. So if it's too loud, I can tell them it's too loud. But I want this to be coming from the inside of, inside of that ensemble, not anything created. And I and I join them. I'm I'm a participant with them. I do my responsibility. They do their responsibility. And you know it's like it's like, it's like a, 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 an athletic team. You have eleven guys, right? One's a quarterback. One's a split end. One's a fullback. You teach them all how to play that position. And when all of them play the position right, it works. Look at We have a band. How do you organize a band? What is the first trumpet player supposed to do? What is the first horn player? What is the fourth horn player supposed to do? They don't know what their responsibility is. They don't know how to make this thing work only from one position, the conductor. No. If my first chair player knows that their responsibility is to make sure that that sec trumpet section is articulating something the way it should be, that's their responsibility. They make a contribution. So I mean, I you know, I had a handbook with all this stuff written in it. You know, this is what the first horn does. This is what the second horn does. This is the fourth horn does. So that we had a team. We all knew what we were doing. And ensembles are created. Great ensembles are the result of sections, not individuals. If you don't have a great trombone section or a great flute section, you don't have a great ensemble. It's the sections, so you have to have. That's why the so the principal player is so important. They have to take pride in their section, and so this comes together, and you have a great large ensemble as a result. It fifty great players, forget it. It doesn't make it. So, and I, I think you have to teach that. I think you have to teach that. You have to tell the first trumpet player what his responsibility is. Frank, if you were starting in the schools these days, <clears throat> what would you do to uh, help encourage a balanced ensemble? Uh, by balance, what do you mean? Uh, full instrumentation. Well, I would recruit, so I'd have a full instrumentation. Well, we're talking now, um, and, and if, if you don't mind me being devil's advocate, there are some parents who believe that their child should be a flute player, mm -hmm. and there might be some that would believe my child is only going to be a drummer. Or my child should get to do what my <laughs> no child wants to do. No one's going to want the child to be a drummer. <laughs> but, the, but parents I, are, are I, I, pushing. I would try to do two things. One, and this is what we did, uh, we put together a, an ensemble made up of the faculty and of the, some good players from the high school. We went to every elementary school and we played a little program for the kids. And we always emphasized what we needed. We also looked at all the kids physically to find out how big their hands were, you know, so that we could tell a kid didn't have enough reach that shouldn't be playing the trombone. Um, and we would, the parents would come, we'd have a meeting for the parents, and we would tell the parents, right, flat out, that, you know, if, you, if your child is playing a flute, these are the opportunities for them. If you're playing an oboe, these are the opportunities for them. In other words, we made it known that if they kept play, playing flute, they probably would not get as many opportunities that if they played bassoon. So, I mean, we just tried to educate them that. Now, it's their call. But, you know, in my last year at the high school, we had eight oboes and eight bassoons in the high school at that time. So, I think you can, I think you can, you have to be, you've got to stay right on top of it, and you have to encourage kids uh, to make a transfer if you see the possibility of it. But I, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a gradual, uh, if, I'm, if I'm trying to convince a parent, then I have to be able to have a, start a conversation with them and start a relationship with them in order to try to try to influence them. Uh, it takes a lot of time. I mean, it's, it's uh, being a high school band director, uh, I don't know when you have any time off. I, I mean, I, I didn't have any time off. I don't know. Maybe uh, you can, but if you're trying to, it seems to me it's just, uh, it demands an awful lot of you. You got to really be. You really got to love it, otherwise you're not going to put up to put up with all you'd have to do. 
It really is. I think it, it comes down to, I know my wife, uh, you know, my wife, uh, she, her friends would always say, why does Frank work so hard? And my wife's answer, I mean, God bless her, she says, because he loves it. And that, I think, is what it boils down to. I mean, it takes great, great dedication. More so than teaching math or anything else, you know. Uh, but it's also the greatest uh, thing in the curriculum, but by far. It, it, it has more effect on kids. Great music, great music teaching has more effect on the development of a child, I think, than any subject in the curriculum. So, you know, I, I just believe it. I believe it, that's all. Did you ever have the students um, be allowed to help choose music that you would perform? I, 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 kids would come in and tell me, can we do this or, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. See, I kept, I kept taking them to concerts, so they would hear the Eastman Wind Ensemble play something or something, and they'd come in and say, let's, let's, can we play this? Hmm. You know, well, we played all the stuff the Eastman Wind Ensemble did. I mean, everything the Eastman Ensemble, we played because the kids heard it That's what they and they wanted to wanted play to it. it. Sure. But that uh, that model has now changed. The Eastman Wind Ensemble will play things that I don't think any high school band can touch. No, that's right. So where are the models these days? They're Is not. It, are they on YouTube? or The division, I mean, the common denominator between the, between the high school band and the college band was the literature. Mm -hmm. We could play anything that they could play. That's not the case anymore. And as a result of that, um, high school band directors that needed, that need the mentorship and the influence of colleges, college band directors, no longer have that. So you have the commercial interests taking over, and they have more effect on the choice of the literature than than we at the college level do, because we no longer share anything. Should we, colleges play some things that high schools could play? Some really great colleges could play a good grade, grade four be, piece or five so that the high schools could? They, well, there needs to be models, and what they don't have now are the models. I mean, they, they, they can see, they can come to concert and see this is a great, great ensemble. They can mm -hmm. see all this stuff being used in the you know, complexity of the music and everything else. But that's not a model. Right. They, they need models, you know. What kinds of experiences should be included in the high school or instrumental music program? Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, in, in 2013, there's a debate going on whether the large ensemble is relevant in music, in delivering music education. There are people who think uh, we can deliver it in better ways. The, th the three kinds of musical experience are the creative, recreative, and consuming. If I'm playing in a school band, 90% of it is, is, is recreating. There's very little creating because you have an ensemble of 65 working under a CEO. They're the workers. They're told what to do and they got to produce. That's corporate America. Beautiful. They don't create, and, and they don't learn how to consume music and enjoy it. In other words, they don't know how to go to a live concert and be able to enjoy it. Of all three, the most important is that one, because they're going to be consumers of music the rest of their life. They're not going to be recreators, or they're not going to be creators. But we do not, practically nothing about this. So, what do you do? You have to structure. I mean, when you, the place which you meet your kids in, it's called the band room usually, right? I call it the music room, because within that room you can do anything you want to do. You can have a recital, you can have a full ensemble rehearsal, you can have a chamber music, you can have somebody come in and play concerts, you can do whatever, you can have student composition, you can do anything you want to do. So if you structure, if you're creative and you structure that, quote, band rehearsal, you can involve a kid in creative, recreative, and consuming experiences. If you go to the traditional program, they'll be primarily recreative. I think that's the problem that everybody is trying to address. 
How do we make it? How do we, how do we help the kid develop the creative abilities? How do we get them to develop the knowledge? Because the more knowledge I have, the, the more I understand, the greater the possibility of appreciation. So that when a kid goes to a live concert, you have to help them develop the knowledge and the preparation that goes into being able to enjoy a live concert. Um, because that's what they're going to do, or not do. I mean, they can go to a pop concert, uh, uh, you know, doesn't demand anything of them. Uh, you go to a, a significant uh, program of significant music, and it demands something of the listener. It, it's very demanding. So you have to help the kid prepare themselves so that they can appreciate, understand, and appreciate it. Um, so I think, I mean, I, th I think you have to, those three experiences have to be embodied in the, in the instrumental program. And you can either do it separately or you can do it in a collective, but you have to structure that collective in ways where they're going to get all three experiences. So if I play devil's advocate for a little bit, because you started the answer with, in 2013, some people think we can do this in other ways, and what is the relevancy of the, of the large ensemble? So what if we were to get rid of the large ensemble and do, it, uh, do more uh, consuming of music in, um, in more pop culture type ensembles? Why not? If I'm, if I'm going to expose kids to music, I can't leave out the works that have been created for large ensembles. I can't do it. A kid in a pop ensemble will have a very narrow spectrum of direct contact. In the large ensemble, I have the possibility, if I'm creative, to expose that kid to the whole stretch of music. They can't do it in a jazz ensemble, can do it in jazz. A uh, pop ensemble can do it in pop, but in the large ensemble, if I am creative, I can expose the kid, and I think can get some sense that it goes from here to here, and there is a history. So, um, uh, it, it's essential that the large ensemble be retained. To take it out is to cheat the kid. You're giving them what they want as opposed to what they should have, so they can appreciate the world they live in. But if the large ensemble attracts only 10% of the school population, what do we do with the other 90? Well, I tell you, that's the problem. The problem is that music education, in, music educators as individuals and music education as, as, as a profession has not spoken strongly as an advocate for great music for all kids all kids. We, we, we're happy if the band has a good schedule, money, the chorus has that, we're perfectly satisfied. Nobody is proclaiming that this is an experience that every kid, and in doing that, we're saying it's not as important. So, I would never have said this as a high school band director. Mm -hmm. But if I were a high school band director now and I had a good band, I'd probably go to my superintendent and say, look, I want to eliminate the band. I don't want to have any great select ensembles until we have a great music program for every single kid in this school. Because music is absolutely essential to their growth. But you said a great music program. And that's where I think some of the, the issues are, because the, the pop culture people will say, well, we'll have music for everybody, but the quality doesn't necessarily, it, it isn't Listen. important. There's more to life than everybody. I mean, everybody is, you know, everybody is doing everybody, right? <laughs> now, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, um, I want everybody too, but I want it in a quality music program. That's the difference. I mean, a curriculum, a structure. I mean, listen, curriculums are based upon the subject and the curriculum are based upon the content of the subject. That's why they're in there. When music can 
be equal to or better than what's being taught in English literature, in chemistry, then we belong in the curriculum. Until then, it belongs as an activities program because we don't do it that way. I mean, in an English lit class, we're reading Dickens, Shakespeare. In a band rehears rehearsal, what are they playing? They're not playing Stravinsky. They're not playing Ives. They're not playing Brahms. They're not playing... How, how can you leave those people out and say you're, you're teaching a, a music? You can't. If you want a playpen for kids to play around with the kind of popular music of the day, fine. The activities program is great. Go for it. But it will never be in the core curriculum. Doesn't doesn't meet the criteria of what uh, you have to be in order to be in the core curriculum. It only meets it when it's when it's taught as an art. Because music is an art. It's not a subject. It is an art. It's different than everything else. And it's important, terribly important.